So I sent out to everyone uh, the first problem set. Um, I wanted to get that to you on Tuesday, but it was a day late, so you have almost a week to get it done. I don't think it's too bad. I, I, it, it, some of them are harder than others, and this one I, I don't think is too bad. It's just, uh, it's mostly a practice to be able to kind of apply these things. And also it's kind of fun. I try to pick problems that are kind of, I don't know, like curiosities you might have had at some point. Um, the thing that I'm really excited about, though, I've never done this before, is uh, a former student of this class, Alex Zoratis. Um, he works with Professor uh, Jason Bird. Um, he just published a really nice paper on how uh, bubbles burst and the wrinkles that they can form when they're really viscous. And the paper uses a lot of the applied mathematical techniques that we're talking about right now. Dimensional analysis, scaling type things. Um, so I don't know if everyone was able to find that. Let's see. Maybe load this. It's right here. So here's the class on my website. I couldn't send it, it was too big to send, but it should look like this. So I'm asking all of you to read this by next uh, Thursday. Um, and then Alex is going to come and basically give kind of a hybrid research presentation, but also talking a bit about like the way the mathematical techniques were applied to um, solve this problem. And so I think that'll be kind of fun. I'm excited for him to come and chat. I think he'll be coming joining on Zoom. Um, and so he's going to come and chat with this. I would, I would ask you all to read through this and uh, come prepared with, with questions and, and, and thoughts. And uh, certainly some of it is not going to be familiar, but I, I think my goal is to kind of, you know, with a class like this, it's to kind of make you more comfortable with mathematical models that are not familiar to you. Um, you know, what I mean by that is like here are the Popple von Karman equations. These are incredibly complicated equations to solve. Um, however, hopefully you can kind of you learn kind of some of the techniques to take something like this that might be unfamiliar to you um, and actually uh, develop some physical intuition for how it works. And so he's going to come next Thursday, join on Zoom and, and uh, talk about uh, this paper and, and some of the kind of applied math that went into it. So problem set due Tuesday, just send me an email with your um, with your solutions. We're going to go through them in class. Um, well, you're going to go through them. So if you're here, you can either bring your computer and kind of walk through what you submitted. Or uh, usually what we do is we have students come up to the board and write out what they did. Um, so you're welcome to do that and use my, my iPad if you want. If you're at home, um, I would ask kind of the same thing. If, you're, if you have a scan or you did this on your computer, if you could be, you know, if you're willing to volunteer to walk through and talk about what you did to solve a problem, uh, that would be fantastic. I think it's a really great way to uh, really demonstrate how much or what your understanding of it. I think being there's like a being able to solve a problem is kind of step one. Being able to explain how you solve that problem to someone else is kind of like tr truly when you start to, to learn and master material. So since this is a 700 level course, I think that mastery of being able to explain what you're doing is really important. And so that's why I um, ask you all to, uh, to volunteer if you're willing. Obviously, there's only six problems, so you know throughout the semester we'll have four or five problem sets. So you'll some of you'll have a chance to volunteer when you're when you'd like. All right, so we've done a couple of problems using dimensional analysis, um, both to come up with scaling laws, to take an equation, identify a similarity variable, simplify that equation. If this is new to you, it can kind of feel a little bit like a black magic, uh, like some sort of weird dark art is happening here. That's even true for me sometimes. Like the person who is really most famous for this material, um, Baron Blatt, you know, I've read through his book numerous times, and there are parts of it where I'm like, where, where did this come from? How did you make that leap? And so 
that's okay. Like, I mean, I don't know a, a way around that. Um, however, there is a formal mathematical method kind of underneath all of this that we'll go through today. You might have seen it before. This is what's referred to as the Buckingham Pi theorem. It's kind of the foundation for dimensional analysis and scaling ideas. I think it's useful to see and to kind of understand how different problems are classified and to kind of help make some of the assumptions that um, we make in discarding variables or approximations seem to stand on more solid ground. I will say I don't use this approach to actually develop mathematical models. This is, it's more that this is kind of what underlies why this works and can kind of give you a sense of why it might not work, which I think is probably the more interesting case. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the Buckingham Pi theorem, introduce the formal mathematical language behind this, just so that you have it and you, you've seen that background. And then what I'll do is I'll go through a problem where scaling doesn't work when you expect that it should work. And you'll kind of get a chance to see, okay, that, you know, some of these classifications that seem kind of formal and arbitrary, okay, I, I understand how you know, these problems kind of fit into this category and work nicely, and now here's a problem that, that doesn't. And so um, that's the goal for today's lecture. So we're going to start by kind of formalizing what we've done so far. And the idea is that our problem always reduces to determining the relationship in, in a form of The, our problems generally reduce to setting up something that looks like this, where we have some dimensional quantity that we would like to determine or develop a model for. So we'll call that quantity A. And we'll say that A is a function of so the governing parameters in our problem. And so some of these governing parameters are going to have independent dimensions. So we'll call the governing parameters that have independent dimensions A with a subscript. And so we'll have, for instance, A1 through looks like AK. And our dimensional parameter A could also be a function of some dimensionless parameters, uh, dimensions that parameters that can be expressed as products of these dimensional parameters. So for instance, we'll call these B, we'll start again with one, and we'll go up to B sub M. Okay, so let me just kind of give you some context for these again, kind of almost just writing out what I just said. So for instance, so A is the dimensional parameter we're interested in. So again, A, I through A, K are the parameters of independent dimensions. And bi through bm are parameters that can be expressed as products of powers of a1 through ak. Okay. 
So for instance, just this one's the one that's probably the most confusing to people. So for instance, like bi might be it'll be written as some quantity oops, ai to some power p1 times a2 to the power p1 times a3 to the power so on so forth so and these powers can be different too again this is confusing and what i'm going to do is show you what I mean through one of the examples we did a moment ago. So stick with me for a second and I'll, I'll make this more clear momentarily. So for any given problem, sometimes you will find that m is equal to zero. And there are no uh, dimensionless quantities that can be written in terms of the dimensionless parameters there. So that means all the dimensions, oops, sorry. all the governing parameters have independent dimensions. Wait, I'm sorry. So the B's they don't have dimensions or they don't have their own dimensions or yeah like those are generally products uh so they're either dimensionless quantities or they're a product that results in a dimensionless quantity this will be more clear in just a moment when i'll, I'll basically outline kind of uh these definitions and i'll go and show you what these things mean in terms of the problem we did with the drag on a sphere. So think of okay, these as you. dimensionless quantities that are either dimensionless themselves, like Poisson ratio, or the combination of the quantities make that uh, product dimensionless. So sometimes there might be no dimensionless uh, quantities in your problem. Um, and sometimes k can be zero as well. And in, the, in that case, all your quantities all the quantities in your problem are dimensionless In general, in general, neither of these are true. In general, k is greater than zero and m is greater than zero. And that's what we've seen so far. So from these definitions, we can construct some dimensionless parameters. So for instance, we can write that pi, capital pi, would be equal to the quantity we're interested in, A, divided by the quantities A1 through, oops, shouldn't be commas, sorry, AK. And we can have a collection of dimensionless, uh, for instance, pi1, which would be B1 over a one to some power times a k to some other power and so on and so forth. So we could have a pi two, which would be b two over some collection of a one to some power p two, because it doesn't have to be the same, 
through a k to some power r2 and pi m would be in general pm over a1 to the pm a k to the r m. Okay, so this is very general, very broad. We're just kind of laying out some definitions. Let's go and look back at one of the solutions we found and define that solution in terms of these variables. So for instance, let's recall the drag on a sphere. So recalling the drag on the sphere, what we found was that the perimeter we're interested in was the drag force. And that drag force was found to be equal to rho r squared v squared times some function f of mu over r v rho. Okay, so looking at this, it's pretty clear that this is the quantity we're interested in, so this should be A. This is going to be A1, A2, A3, and this is double checking here. This is B1. And here you find that this is A1 to the power 1. So I'll write that to be kind of overly explicit. A2 to the power 1 and A3 to the power 1. And so now we can start to kind of connect this to the dimensionless parameters. So we would find that let's see here. Sorry, I'm lost. So A1 was rho. Mm -hmm. But the Oh I yeah, I wrote them in the wrong order. Thank you. What did I do here? Let's try easier to switch this. Sorry, everyone. Rho, R, and V. And this is shooting the A2 to the power of 0.5. Did we have that as to the 0.5? I thought it was all to the first. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So, oh, I'm sorry. I thought R you're squared was A2. Like you're saying R is A2. Yeah, sorry. I'm saying R, yeah, thank you, thank you. So I'm, I'll circle what I'm talking about so it's more clear. Saying this is a, this is, yeah. Cool. Thank you. Those, those are good questions. Um, okay. So now, going back, we can construct capital pi, which would be the, we didn't do this, but we're going to write it now. We can construct capital pi, which would be the drag force over rho r squared v squared would be equal to some function. Uh, I'm going to use, it doesn't matter. I'm going to use a different symbol for function up uh, because, yeah, I'm going to, yeah, I'll just keep this thing. We'll call it f of rho over, sorry, mu over rho r v. where this quantity is pi and this quantity is pi 1. Which is nice because in general what this 
is trying to say is that in general we should be able to construct our what we're looking for our solution for our problem as pi our dimensionless ratio of what we're interested in over the in the, in the over the parameters that have independent dimensions which would be equal to some arbitrary function here i'm calling it uh, capital psi or phi remember uh, of pi one and in general this can be a collection of these things so pi one pi two up to pi m okay So let's take a minute to see what we've done. This is just formalizing what we've done. So what we've done is we've done, we have some quantity we're interested in A, it has some dimension or uh, dimensional, uh, some characteristic dimensions. It's going to be written as some function of parameters with independent dimensions, as well as parameters that are products of uh, some parameter and those parameters that contain independent dimensions such that we can construct the dimensionless parameters pi, which is the ratio of what we're interested in over the parameters that have independent dimensions, and then various dimensional products, which are going to be the parameters uh, B1 divided by the parameters of independent dimensions raised to some uh, collection of powers. And hopefully this example here gives you some context for what all these kind of general roots. What these kind of general definitions mean. So this is the formal classification and way of, of, of writing this. And what I'll do now is, is now that we have this definition, kind of walk through what the Buckingham Pi theorem actually says. And so I'll, I'll go here, report this. So I'll read this just for the sake of reading it, but instead of writing it out, the, physical, the Buckingham Pi theorem is saying that the physical relationship between a dimensional quantity and several dimensional parameters can be rewritten as a relationship between a dimensionless parameter and several dimensionless products of the governing parameters. The last one is the one that you'll see quite a bit, so I'm going to highlight it, which is that the number of dimensional products is equal to the number of governing parameters minus the number of independent dimensions. Okay, so that's the Buckingham Pi theorem. It's really just formalizing stuff that is saying, how do we know we have a valid mathematical statement? Well, if we have a valid mathematical statement, it has to be dimensionally consistent. We're looking for a quantity with particular dimensions that has to be equal to something on the right hand side of the equation that has the same dimensions. And then it could also be multiplied by something that has no dimensions at all. And this is just a way of kind of formalizing that definition. One of the things that is really practical and oftentimes confusing upon first seeing it is understanding when one of the dimensional products, pi 1, pi 2, so on and so forth, is essential. It means that we have to keep it in our model. So when, when are the dimensional products essential? And the dimensionless products are generally considered essential if they're not too small and not too large. This one usually throws people off. People are usually generally comfortable with the idea that if, for instance, uh, the dimensionless parameter pi sub m is really small, people are comfortable kind of throwing that out and saying, well, it's probably really negligible. What trips people up is the idea that 
you should be throwing away dimensionless products that are really large. So I'm going to write out what this what is deemed essential. It's something that's not too small, not too not too large. So for example, we would say roughly between kind of one tenth and about ten. This is an essential parameter. Most people are comfortable with the idea that you throw it out if it's too small. So why are we throwing it out if it's too large? And I'll go back to the drag on a sphere problem. So, so with this drag on a sphere problem, you recall we had an unknown kind of exponent that we had to solve for. We had three independent dimensions, and we had four unknown exponents. And so what we did is we chose one of them. Left it, uh, left it unknown, and we ended up with this form of the drag force. Uh, there we go. We, I don't think we actually showed this directly in class. It's in the notes, so you can kind of go on my typed up notes to see this. You can choose an arbit a different parameter as a Leibniz unknown and solve for it. And what you'll get is a drag force proportional to a different set of those independent parameters. It'll still be dimensionally consistent, and you'll end up with a different uh, uh, dimensionless product in this uh, in this uh, in this arbitrary function, uh, unknown function here. To make this even more explicit, you can solve this problem such that this right here is one over the Reynolds number. You choose a different way of solving for your uh, unknown. So we at A, B, C, and D, we left D unknown. If we go back and leave A unknown, what you can find is that you'll have a different set of quantities here, some unknown function, and instead of it being one over the Reynolds number, you can find that it'll be the Reynolds number. And so that kind of makes it a little bit more clear as to why we throw out parameters that are small, but also large, because in solving for this for these dimensionless groups or dimensionless products, you can either get one parameter or kind of one over that parameter. So those two statements of being too small or too large are essentially equivalent because the way you solve the problem, you might get the parameter or one over the parameter. So that thing being small is equivalent to that thing, one over that thing being large. And so in general, it's reasonable to assume that if your dimensionless parameter is small or large, assume that it can be neglected. An example of this might be going back to the projectile problem. We could have included dra drag uh, and air resistance in that problem. And the reason we didn't is because we assumed that that quantity was small, so we neglected it. Or maybe a more explicit example is going back to the brittle fracture problem, where I, I kind of, so I'm going to, maybe I'll go through this here. So in the brittle fracture problem, I kind of just neglected to write. So if you recall, what we were looking for was the, the crack width, or the kind of the width of the, of the base of that cone, capital D. And we said, okay, well, capital D should be some function of uh, the applied load, the stress intensity factor, the Poisson ratio. But we also could have left in the size of the punch, little d, 
and the size of the the fused silica cap, capital oops thank you capital delta had we done that what we would have found is we would have gotten a slightly different answer we would have gotten that we would have gotten that our cone base diameter was proportional to p over k to the two thirds times some unknown function of Poisson ratio and then two dimensionless products. What are those dimensionless products? Well, those dimensionless products, recall this here is a, has a units of length. So what we would have gotten was the base of the cone would scale as p over k to the two thirds times some unknown function of Poisson ratio and little d over p over k to the two thirds capital delta over p over k to the two thirds. Now in this language of the Buckingham Pi theorem, we would say this is pi one, this is pi two, this is pi three. And we made an assumption that our scaling should be valid in some intermediate region, intermediate asymptotic regime in which we said, well, pi two, Pi two is really small. The width of that punch is really small relative to p over k to the two thirds. And pi three is really large. So the, the fused silica is massive compared to, to the, uh, the length scale that characterizes the base of that cone. So we could have kept all this had those in there said, well, I expect for the problems that we're looking at the D over P over K to the two thirds would be small and Delta over P over K to the two thirds would be large. And so therefore I can say, well, let's neglect And we would have arrived at the same problem that we did before because we're assuming that those dimensionless parameters are too small or too large and thus can be neglected, which will allow us to still uh, determine the relationship between the parameter we're interested in and the dimensional parameters of our problem. There's a technicality here that uh, I think is probably most interesting if you are like a, in a less of a mechanician or a physicist and more of a true mathematician, which is to say that these things can be neglected if, so I'm going to write this down. So more formally, So our dimensionless parameter that is small or large this can be neglected if phi of uh, our dimensionless products has a finite non-zero limit as pi sub m either goes to zero or infinity, depending on if you're saying it's small or large. 
Now, in general, we are unable to kind of test this uh, technical limit mathematically to actually determine what the limit uh, is as pi m kind of goes to zero or infinity. T typically, what is done is you neglect it, come up with a model, either do some simulations or some experiments, and then test the results of those experiments with your model and see if your model uh, is able to predict that behavior. And if it's not, then you can safely assume that you were it was unreasonable for you to neglect that parameter. But this is the formal definition, so I, I want to make sure that it's, it's, it's stated. So this is this uh, let's see here. Oops. This is what's known as complete similarity. So the whole theorem is called complete similarity or just the pi going to zero and pi going to infinity? The ability to throw away a dimensionless perimeter because our function has a finite non-zero limit as that perimeter goes to zero infinity, that is what's known as complete similarity. So the so for instance, yeah. the punch problem where we were looking at brittle fracture is an example of a complete of complete similarity. We threw out two parameters because we said that they're small, they're large. We developed the model. It predicted that the cone, cone width should scale as p over k to the two thirds. We tested that model. It looked really nice. It did seem to work. And so that was an example of a problem of complete similarity because the parameters we neglected, it was safe to neglect. Thank you. Good question. Sometimes we'll see this written as similarity of the first kind. Okay, so this is what you're hoping for, basically. And essentially, if you have a problem where you do this whole process, and it turns out this is not true, generally kind of quite unfortunate. <laughs> in, my, in my experience, you basically can say, oh, well, I have a problem that's incomplete similarity. I, I can't neglect this thing that I thought I could neglect. Now I'm kind of stuck. What do I do now? Um, you can reduce it to a problem that is maybe a little bit more tractable, but it, but it can become uh, quite tricky. I'm going to go through that. So we're going to demonstrate a problem that looks like a scaling law should be adequate to define it. We develop a scaling law, and we'll see that we neglect some things. It's unreasonable to neglect them, and putting them back in doesn't really help us a ton. Um, so we'll see that in a moment. And that example, that case where we uh, have a problem that where we can't neglect this is what's referred to as incomplete similarity. Or similarity of the second kind. Okay, so similarity of the second kind of incomplete similarity occurs when um, if the in the limit of pi m going to zero or infinity, the function does not uh, have a finite non-zero limit 
In that case, what that means physically is that the parameter, so for instance, so the dimensionless product pi m means you have some parameter b sub m over some products. And what you'd like to do is throw out b sub m. And what, in this case, when you have a problem that contains incomplete similarity, it means that b sub m can remain essential no matter how small or large its corresponding uh, dimensionless parameter becomes. There's still some things you can do in this case in which you have a, uh, a parameter that can't be discarded. So, so what can you do? Well, there is one thing you can do is if if your unknown function has a power law. asymptotic representation. Then you can kind of rewrite your function in, in, in a in a new way that kind of accounts for the parameter that you'd like to discard but you can't. Again, I don't and have I don't I find this kind of nice to know, but not necessarily useful to uh, kind of improve or develop your mathematical model. Or at least I have not kind of encountered a case where this has helped me uh, overcome an obstacle. So for instance, you can write in this case you can write this as phi is equal to pi sub m raised to some unknown exponent alpha times some new function phi one which just contains the parameters that were that are left although we took away one because we pulled it out plus some higher order terms this is that's what this is capital o means it means terms of the order i sub m to the alpha, where this term is small. Small compared with the first term. This can be, this definition allows us to write, let's see if I can do this. This allows us to write something like pi star is equal to phi sub one. What I just wrote up there, so it's going to be pi one where pi star now is pi over pi this is equal to pi over pi sub m to the alpha. The end result of this is that you are able to write kind of 
the quantity that you want over all the quantities in your problem that have dimensions. So A1 times some P minus alpha times some quantity times all the way up to AK to a different power minus alpha times a different power times B sub M. This isn't very satisfying and it's probably a little bit confusing and that's okay. This is just to show that this quantity that we would like to neglect because it's small or large, it's still appears. And here's where stuff like experiments or, or and or uh, numerical analysis simulations can help us because alpha and pi star cannot be determined by dimensional analysis alone. The part that makes this so complicated and the reason why you can't use dimensional analysis for problems like this is that alpha itself may depend on the dimensionless products in the problem. Oops. Again, I'm going to give you an example of, of uh, where this occurs and essentially what to do when it happens. And so this is the formal definition. As I've said, at least in the context of this incomplete second similarity, uh, I don't find this particularly um, useful to improve your model development, but it, what it does is allow you to understand why your model development went wrong or why the scaling you derived that seems like everything is reasonable, why it doesn't actually model your data. So think of this as kind of like a, you have a nice set of experiments, you see a trend that seems like, no, there's a, there's a it seems like I should be able to describe this with a scaling law. You do your due diligence, write down all the parameters that should matter, arrive at some combination of dimensionless parameters and dimensionless uh, products and throw some out and then figure out, oh, okay, I, I, I have this nice scaling. It doesn't work. Why? How is this possible? Buckingham High was wrong, blah, blah, blah. It's your, your problem contains something that you really can't discard and, and it's in a different class of problems that are much more complicated to solve. In this case, pick up Baron Blatt's book and kind of walk through what to do in the case of incomplete similarity. I'm not going to get too deep into the weeds with that because it's, um, you know, it, it could be a whole course in and of itself. And, I, and to be honest, I think there are more useful uh, techniques to, to, uh, to work through. The, the third option, so there's either complete similarity in which you th throw out some parameters and it works fine. Incomplete similarity where you throw out some parameters, it doesn't work because maybe you can't neglect one of the things you thought you could. There's a, a, another example in which there's no finite limit for our unknown function, capital phi, as your dimensionless parameter goes to zero infinity. And if there's no limit, that's, that's the case of there being a complete lack of similarity in your problem. All right, so in general, what do you do? You do what we've done so far. You 
write down what do you want to know, and then by either intuition or looking at the governing equations and boundary conditions of your problem, you write down that, oh, my parameter A should be some function of all of these things. You construct the dimensionless groups. You construct pi, pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, pi 4. You, using intuition about the problem, estimate the magnitude of the dimensionless parameters, pi 1, pi 2, and so on and so forth. And if they're small or large, you throw them out. You'll end up with a model. You test it against something, experiments or simulations. If it doesn't work, you have uh, a, a case of, of incomplete similarity. At that point, you can either try to formalize this and go into uh, a more complicated approach to dimensional analysis, uh, or you turn to uh, a different uh, way to model your, your problem, not relying on dimensional analysis alone. That's kind of a general recipe for this similarity analysis. Okay, so the, that general recipe is really what I want you to take away. It's really this idea that you should be able to, from intuition or your equations, write down this. Once you have that, collect your dimensionless product that you want, and then the dimensionless parameter that it depends on, such that pi is some function of all of these parameters. We recall how this looks for the drag on a sphere, in which you know, this is our pi, this is our unknown function. I guess I should be more clear here. This is I used F when we were doing it, but in the formal definition, they use capital Phi. So this is your Phi. And I think the thing that's really useful is here, which is when can you neglect things? You might ask, like, why do you want to neglect things? Like, why not just keep it all? And the reason is for each dimensionless product that you keep in there, so pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, pi 4, I, I believe, I don't want to get this too wrong, but I believe for each one that you uh, maintain in there, you need to do basically an order of magnitude more is worth of experiments to kind of confirm your model. So if you just keep them all in there, then you're left with a really significant number of experiments or simulations to do to validate the model that you're developing, which could be either cost intensive if you're doing this with simulations or impractical if you're doing this with um, uh, experiments in the lab. And so it's not as simple as, well, why don't we just retain everything? You, you run into other challenges if you're kind of retaining everything there. Questions? Is it possible to use shifted parameters in your domain analysis? But is that keep the value of the dimensional the dimensionless parameter is the same in your experiment, but it's not neglected in your theory. In the in that case you don't have to do more experiment. Yeah. Yeah, so it is. The challenge that is that in general if you have something that you kind of wish you could neglect, but you decide I'm going to keep it in there, there's usually like a physical consequence to that. And we'll see that with this example of fatigue in a minute. And that physical consequence can be pretty severe. So I'll kind of, the spoiler alert to the fatigue problem is, you know, with the drag on a sphere, we talked about the ability to develop a um, kind of a, a scale model. So I can do this in a lab, just keep pi fixed, and then I'll know what's going to happen to my much bigger sphere that I can't do, which is really useful. I mean, uh, I think the Navy has, or Air Force has, scale models of like the F, F-16 and scale models of various buildings where they're using this approach of calculating the drag force on this small version to predict what's going to happen on a much larger version. In the problem that we're going to see with fatigue, which is an example of 
a problem that has incomplete similarity, the result of that incomplete similarity is that you can't construct scale models. You can't simply say, okay, I'm going to make a small sample. I'm going to build an airplane propeller. I'm going to build it to small scale. I'm going to run it for some number of loading cycles because I want to know when my propeller is going to fail. And I say, okay, I'll just do this on a small scale. I'll use my scaling analysis to kind of scale this up to the size of a true propeller. The incomplete similarity in that problem has the physical consequence that scaling up the behavior you're seeing on a small scale does not predict anything about what happens when you scale up to the big scale, even if you fix the pi parameters in your problem. Physically, that means fatigue is a really hard problem. We still primarily rely on empirical formulas for fatigue. We like literally do a bunch of experiments, fit our data, okay, here's what we expect, kind of build things off of those empirical models. Because there are parameters in that problem that seem small and don't scale as we kind of fix the pi constant in there, which is really, I mean, I like the question you're asking because it's, it seems kind of intuitive, like, well, I'll just keep it fixed and then I can kind of move along accordingly. And I think it's really surprising to modelers when they find out, like, oh, this is actually really doesn't work. <laughs> like this, uh, you know, this kind of starts to fall apart. So, yeah, unfortunately not. And usually those are kind of the hallmarks of like really challenging engineering problems. All right, should we get into the fatigue case? Can we go through this example? Uh, why don't we do this? Why don't we take a break for like two minutes, catch your breath, and stop listening to me speak, and then we'll talk about fatigue. All right? And if you have questions, you can either jump down now, I can talk about them. I will mainly try to uncramp my hand. <laughs> 
All right, should we get back to it? So, to discuss the more complicated version of similarity problems, the case of incomplete similarity, we're going to look at this problem of fatigue crack growth. If you're unfamiliar with solid mechanics, you might not know much about physically what fatigue is, but fatigue is the gradual failure of a structure under cyclical loading. This is really important in a, in a variety of problems from automobile design, uh, aircraft design in particular. Um, you know, when you think about aircraft design, a lot of the airplanes you're flying on are pre-COVID when you actually were flying, um, are, have been in the air for an incredibly long time, for many, many years, in which you're talking about kind of liftoff, uh, kind of cruising, landing. And then in that process, you might have propeller blades or some other uh, things. So for instance, your wings undergoing kind of tiny vibrations for a really long time. There are two kind of general uh, types of fatigue. Um, one is called low cycle, one is called high cycle. High cycle fatigue is like you, the, the kind of the wing bending problem where it's flexing a very tiny amount. It's significantly below the um, like the the failure criteria or yield criteria of your material, so you're just kind of loading it really simply for, but it might be loaded for tens, hundreds of thousands, even a million cycles, and you need to know, you know, will this thing survive under that type of loading? A low cycle fatigue is is the opposite case where you're loading something kind of with loads that are comparable or you know maybe within an order of magnitude of the failure criteria of your material. And at that case, the typical number of cycles you're looking at are a couple orders of magnitude less before you might see failure. So why does it fail? Well, it kind of fails for the same reason that we discussed in the crack growth problem, where you have this material or you have this structure that contains some defects. And those defects are kind of just slowly increasing in size as you load them microscopically or nanoscopically, there might be a crack in your material or some, it doesn't even have to be a crack. It could be, you know, you have uh, some alloy with grain boundaries and at that grain boundary, you can kind of, uh, the, the, uh, the interface there could be shearing or elongating. So you have some example in which a defect or kind of crack or structural uh, problem is slowly growing as you load this uh, thing over and over again. It's not an easy problem because typically, as you know, as engineers, the way we figure out when something is going to fail is we just pull on it till it breaks. <laughs> and that's our way of kind of testing things. You can't really take an airplane wing off and do destructive testing to figure out, oh wait, we had actually had 10,000 more cycles before this is gonna break. There's a whole world of research on non-destructive testing. Like, how do you figure out the amount of uh, micro cracks present in a sample without actually loading the sample at all? People look at uh, techniques from acoustics, 
they're sending waves in there and seeing how, how these things are are uh, passing through the material, you know, maybe uh, after n number of uh, cyclical loads. You would think that you could say, well, I know what my aircraft wing is made out of, I know the, the materials, why don't I just take a small sample of it, put a, a notch of length L into that thing, pull on it, in this case in uniaxial loading, the loading here is a little bit different than what you're used to. Usually we're thinking about uh, loading in terms of like a applied load or applied stress. In these fatigue tests, what they're usually characterizing is a um, kind of a, a stress, it's a applied stress intensity factor. So that's what this N is. And you'll notice that N has units similar to K that we described before. K was a material parameter. K is like the stress intensity uh, factor of a given material and is like your applied one. I'm going to apply some stress intensity um, to this thing because I know there's a crack there and I'm going to cyclically do it. So I'm going to ride up to n max and then with some particular wavelength here from that wavelength I know a frequency and I can monitor in the lab how this crack grows as a function of um, various cycles here. And the idea would be, well, if I can do this on a desktop scale, maybe I can predict how this thing is going to fail uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the real world. So here you see something that as a mathematical model or, or, or a versioning mathematical model, you say, oh, that looks like there's a, look, there's a log log graph. Um, if this is too small, by the way, this same thing is in the PDF of my notes. You can load it up and look at it. But you see something is a log log graph. There's something with some sort of power law trend there. Again, kind of recalling ideas from kind of the framework of intermediate asymptotics, where you know we see this power law occurring here, and then that eh, kind of falls off at really low applied uh, stress intensity factor, and seems to deviate at really high stress intensity factor. So maybe we'll concern ourselves with just what's happening in this intermediate regime. And by just looking at this and just curve fitting, uh, experimental mechanicians found a, an empirical scaling law, which is that the kind of change in crack length averaged per kind of over the over each cycle was found to scale as uh, two constants, one constant is capital A times our delta N, which is the kind of difference in applied uh, stress intensity factor raised to some power M. And so we, this is just literally a curve fit. And so there's a lot of questions you could ask, like, you know, what are A and M are these um, material properties. Are they something related to geometry or specimen size? And so let's like hope that we can use dimensional analysis and these similarity principles to see if we can determine if A and M come from these material properties or the size of the specimen. The number of parameters in this problem is, is rather large. So again, this is what we're looking for, DLDN. So we might write that DLDN depends on some function, clearly of delta N. It can depend on what's called the loading asymmetry. I do something that is symmetric here. So 
meaning that like the if this is my middle line here, the amount above it and the amount below it are the same, but it doesn't have to be. So we can come over here and say, well, let me look at n max over n min for the sake of brevity. We'll call this R going forward. It certainly might depend on the frequency that it's loaded at and the time. You can probably guess without really doing any dimensional analysis, heavy lifting, that if I multiply frequency times time, so I should have written time, I should have written T. That, that gives you a dimensionless uh, parameter right there, the product of those two. Let me just write out what they are. There's some geometry to this sample, so the, the characteristic geometry that we would assume would matter here uh, would be the, the thickness of this material. Call it an H. This is the, really it's just the characteristic specimen size. In this case, it's, it's going to be our, our thickness here. Obviously, we could make this thing incredibly wide or incredibly tall, but it's that kind of crack width to the thickness that's going to that, that's going to be really important. I said that. Failure or the growth of a crack is going to be dictated by some uh, failure criterion of the material, some material property there. So that could either be um, the stress intensity factor, like K, which will be used for the brittle fracture. Fatigue is what you're usually seeing here is kind of this slow crack propagation in which near the tip of the crack, you're seeing some like local plasticity occurring, which then softens there, crack grows a little bit, softens, grows, softens, grows. And so you're not typically concerned as much with the brittle fracture, but more with a um, ductile fracture. And the ductile fracture is going to be dictated by the yield stress as opposed to the uh, stress intensity factor. So we're going to look at both, but we need to consider kind of both yielding and that kind of uh, uh, how the stress is amplified near the crack. So instead of just looking at K1C, we're going to look at sigma Y, which is the yield stress. If you know nothing about solid mechanics or material mechanical behavior of materials, your yield stress is where as you pull on something, it's going to behave elastically for a bit. And then at some point, it's going to start to deviate from elastic behavior, soften, and maybe start to kind of neck or uh, and necking means you can kind of can you can pull it without uh, really applying much force at all. Um, it's kind of you can imagine taking a sheet of saran wrap and kind of pulling that sheet of saran wrap. This thing will eventually just kind of stretch out and become really soft. And that's the, the point at which it goes from being kind of stiff to soft is that yield stress. And this is the stress intensity factor that you probably expected to see there. You, we could go through this dimensional analysis to figure out what these dimensional parameters are. I'm going to do that um, that work for you here, so we can uh, talk about kind of the meat of the problem. And what we find if we go through the dimensional analysis is that DLDN should depend on. Delta N over the yield stress 
squared. So recall that delta n has the uh, units of uh, stress times the square root of length. Yield stress has the units of stress. So stress over stress cancels out, and you're left with square root of length. Squared gives you a length, and this is kind of length per cycle. And delta n is really uh, applied stress intensity factor kind of per cycle. So you end up with length per cycle, length per cycle. And then we have a bunch of dimensionless parameters. So we have delta n over kic. This should be clear that it's going to be dimensionless, stress intensity factor, stress intensity factor. This is my r, which is already dimensionless. So this thing entered as dimensionless. Oops. This is the ratio of those two stress intensity factors. We have a complicated one that would fall out of the dimensional analysis, which is the yield stress as a square root of h. So stress as a square root of length. So that should be clearly be divided by uh, stress intensity factor. This is a material property over a material property. So kind of the, you can think of that ratio as the kind of ratio of ductile to brittle kind of fracture, if you will. And the one we said before, which is um, F of T, uh, F times T. We can look at, as we said, some kind of intermediate regime where we can assume that the product of f of t is either really small or, or really large and can be neglected. And so it's pretty, we can choose our experiment in such a way that we can throw out this last dimensionless parameter. And what we'll do is let's look at another one here, which is this thing. Um, professor, I have a quick question. Yeah. Um, so what you're writing down right here is after we do the whole, um, like the pi and everything, and then we figure it out, right? Yeah, what I'm writing down here is if, if you had written like, you could have gone through the process of saying, um, well, uh, DL, DN, the units of DL, DN should equal delta N to the A times R to the B times uh, F to the C. T to the D, H to the E, this whole messy world of things. If you go through this process and um, solve for your, uh, you're going to end up with, I think, just three uh, independent dimensions, length, mass, and time. And you'll end up with a bunch of dimensionless. We have, clearly have uh, like seven um, unknowns. So we would expect to have uh, four dimensionless parameters. So seven minus three is four. And so we see we have um, one, two, three, four dimensionless parameters. So I basically skipped the step of going from here to here. But had you had done that, that approach of kind of um, solving for an unknown, putting it back in for um, length, mass, and time, your three equations, you'll end up with a bunch of unknowns, all raised to various exponents, and the result of that would be this here. And if I took this, divided by this, that would be capital pi. This would be pi 1, pi 2, pi 3, pi 4. And I'm saying we're going to choose our experiments in such a way, since we're controlling it, frequency and time, we're going to choose our experiments in such a way that we can neglect pi 4, 
And I'm actually going to tell you right now that we can, uh, both in high cycle and low cycle fatigue, delta N over KIC is really, really small. You're usually applying a small load relative to the um, stress intensity factor that'll fracture the material. So both of these, we can assume we can throw out. Does that answer your question? Yes, um, and just another quick one. Um, is that last term F sub T or F times T? No, sorry, it's F times T. So frequency is one over time and time is time. So they create a dimensionless product. So multiplying F times T. All right, thank you. Yeah. So we can neglect F of T because we can choose it so that it's uh, either small or large, depending on like essentially how long of a time sample we look at. Um, and I'm kind of just telling you that if you know anything about fatigue, these tests are typically done such that delta N over KIC is small. For both high cycle and even low cycle fatigue, that quantity is pretty small. So what does that mean? We can neglect them which is the kind of that second step in their, in their recipe for similarity analysis. You kind of write down um, all of this. You get your dimensionless groups, which is all of this. You see if anything that you can neglect, and you assume complete similarity. So you assume that I can neglect them, and it's going to be completely fine. So we're going to assume complete similarity. I'm going to throw out those two things. And reduce this equation to DLDN should be delta N over sigma Y squared times some unknown function of I should do one more thing. Just for the sake of my writing list, I'm going to define ah, this thing as Z. So this is what we're left with is kind of R and Z. So coming back down here, I have is some function of R and some function of Z. Now, recalling what we have over here, it seems like we're actually doing pretty well, right? Because look, I have that DLDN should be some function of delta N to the M times the material constant. And look what I have. I have delta N, del delta N to the 2 over some material constant. So I can rewrite this to make it more aligned with the Empirical scaling. So I'm just going to rearrange our variables so it looks more like what was found before. So this would be, I should be clear, this is, I'm going to call this phi 1 just to be clear that I, phi would be keeping everything and phi 1 is just the reduced one where we threw out some parameters. So I can rewrite this and say that I have phi 1 which contains some uh, loading parameter, R, which is N max over N min, and some kind of coupled material and geometric parameter, Z, which contains two material parameters, yield stress and uh, stress intensity factor, uh, and the specimen size. So this is great. And I can divide that by the yield stress squared. And the reason I'm doing this is just, like I said before, because now it looks like I'm done. I can say, this is my M. And this quantity here is my A. And therefore, I have A delta N squared. 
Ooh, nope, sorry. Delta N to the N. And it looks great. It looks like I'm done. Except when you compare with data from your experiments, you find that M is definitively not two. This is the important part here. You're a mathematical modeler. You have some problem. You have some empirical relation. You're trying to figure out based on your curve fitting. I have two parameters in my curve fitting. Can I use the dimensional analysis to determine what those parameters are? I would assume that there are some combination of material and geometric parameters. Great. So I do my dimensional analysis. I neglect things that seem small or large. And then I end up with exactly what I was searching for, a scaling that looks like A delta N to the delta N to the M, which is what we find empirically. Great. Not only that, but we learned from our dimensional analysis that M should be two. We assumed complete similarity. We developed a mathematical model. It's now something we can compare with our data. Comparing with our data here, M isn't two. So this is an example where our assumption of complete similarity fails. So we can assume something that looks that maybe now we're dealing with a problem of incomplete similarity. So you recall I kind of shuffled around some parameters and ended up with a pi star and uh, the introduction of alpha. We're going to do that here now as well, just to show you what that looks like. So we assumed complete similarity. It didn't work. Now we'll assume that maybe we have a problem of incomplete similarity. And if we have a problem that contains incomplete similarity, what do we do? Well, if you recall, we take the parameter that we threw out because we said it was small and we bring it back in. The parameter that we threw out because we said it was small is the delta n over kic. We said we're even in low cycle fatigue, that thing is typically small, probably doesn't matter. Now we have to bring it back. So we can say my unknown function should probably be written as delta n over kic to the alpha, we're calling, that's my dimensionless parameter, pi m is this, and I'm raising it to some unknown constant alpha, and then I need to multiply that by my reduced unknown function my reduced unknown function is this thing. So let's do that. And then inserting my unknown function capital Phi back into the problem, I arrive at a more complicated scale, DLDN should equal delta n to the two plus alpha. So where the two come from? Well, the two is there from our dimensional analysis from before, but now we're multiplying it again because delta n appears out here as alpha, raised to the alpha. So it should be two to the plus alpha over my yield stress squared KIC to the alpha. So this number here comes from here, which came from our dimensional analysis. The yield stress squared also came from the dimensional analysis. And then KIC to the alpha comes from our assumption of incomplete similarity. And then I have to write out my last thing, which is by one to the R uh, of R and Z. Alpha is 
a number. We don't know what it is. We know that in general, in general, alpha should could likely could be a function of r and z. That is, in general, that constant that we're raising our small parameter to could depend on the dimensionless parameters in our problem. To put this maybe back in the notation that looks similar to the scaling from before, and just basically just rearranging variables here, I can write that DLDN will look like phi1 of r and z over sigma y squared kic to the alpha times delta n to 2 plus alpha. This is just a rewriting so that it looks more like the form we had before where we'll say this quantity is now A and this quantity is now M. So we don't know what alpha is and we don't know what A is at this point. We know that they're both a function of the material properties, the load asymmetry, and the specimen size. So we did learn a little bit about what those things come from. So it's not only material properties and specimen size. We also have to consider that those two unknown constants are going to depend on the load asymmetry. The, this might seem like a disappointing result. You know, I, I think as applied mathematicians, what you're looking for is like, I've got data, I want to put a curve on that data that comes from some uh, fundamental physical uh, theory. However, this result is still instructive. It tells you what experiments you need to do. Because now what this tells you is to determine A and M, you really need to consider specimen size, your yield stress and critical uh, stress intensity factor, and the load asymmetry. And the other thing this tells you is because these quantities that control the scaling, these quantities A and M, depend on material properties and specimen size, you can now know and tell the engineers working on this problem that you have to be extremely cautious taking results from a small scale, a small specimen size, and scaling it up to a large specimen size. So the fact that our unknown constants here, the fact that this quantity here that we're raising our exponents to could depend on specimen size means you can't simply take the dimensionless parameters in your problem, scale them up at a fixed pi, and predict what's going to happen on a, on a large uh, specimen. So you can't kind of do the small propeller to large propeller, here's what's going to happen, because the constants in your property, in your, in your problem, depend on the size of your sample. So it's unsatisfying. We don't have the scaling that we can derive from this. However, we do have important information that we can give to an engineer on site, which is if you need to figure out how this thing is going to behave on a large scale, you need to do your experiments on the scale that you're concerned with. There, that also applies for if you're going to do computer simulations, modeling of, of, of your specimen. You can't reduce the size of these parameters because the behavior you're trying to model is going to depend on that size. So while it's unsatisfying, it still is providing really important insight and, and knowledge to people who are trying to determine this. And you'll see like there's a fantastic video I think Boeing did uh, where they are trying to kind of validate their computational model of like the maximum deflection of an airplane wing and they like literally just hook these airplane wings up to steel cables and lift the airplane up off the ground and bend the wings until the point of failure. It's a spectacular, it's on YouTube, it's a, I'll try to link to it somewhere. It's a spectacular video of them doing this kind of large scale testing to validate their computational models. It's stuff like this that can inform and tell you 
when you can create scale models and when you can't. So even though this incomplete similarity doesn't give us the answer we want, it's providing us kind of physical insight into the problem that we're studying. Questions? Why did we choose the round parameter? So let's say I know nothing about the mean. So I maybe think that the let's say Young's modulus will affect. Mm -hmm. So I put it in my genetic analysis, so you can match it in my experiment. But how can I find out that that's not the yeah, so that's a good question. So the, for those who are remote and can't hear it, the question was like, what if you pick a parameter that doesn't matter? Um, so sometimes what happens is that parameter falls out. If you recall the projectile problem that we did, I think on the first class, we assumed that the height of the projectile would depend on gravity, the initial velocity, and the mass of the, of the object that we're throwing. And then we did the dimensional analysis and we found out that the exponent on the mass term was zero, which meant the mass term goes away. So in some cases, the dimensional analysis on, a, on something that you think matters but doesn't will lead to that argument dropping out. In other cases, what will happen is it will appear in a dimensionless quantity that leads to a dimensionless parameter that is small or large. Because the thing you think matters is only matters relative to something comparable in that problem. And so the way, the other example, if it doesn't drop out with dimensional analysis, is that you might create a dimensionless product that is small or large. You can discard it and hope that discarding it is reasonable. And then you do this process of incomplete similarity where you, OK, say I threw out three parameters, doesn't work. I'll bring one back in. What does that tell me? I can bring a second one back in. I can do this process again and say, okay, I have another, maybe I need to bring in young modules back there. Um, but there's basically two ways. One is it'll drop out of the dimensional analysis. And two is it might matter, but small. Like it might have a really small effect. And so then therefore you can discard it. So you, the general kind of rule or approach is to, at first, only include the parameters that you're like certain are going to matter as few as possible. Develop scaling, test it. That's the thing that I kind of want to make clear here. Like I'm picking problems and I'm giving you the parameters that um, are pretty well defined. If you're doing something, you know, on a research level, the real approach is you start with the fewest ingredients possible, develop a scaling, test it against something, see if it works. Nope, it didn't work. Okay, what could I have been missing? Add one more thing back in. Develop a new scaling, test it if it works. When I'm developing scalings for our problems, it is incredibly rare that I get it on the first try. I get something, I get a model, but it's, not, it's often the wrong model. The approach is to kind of, because kind of the more parameters you keep increases the number of experiments you need to do to test your model by like an order of magnitude, the, the best bet is to start with as few as possible, test it, okay, that didn't work, add one back in, test it, did that work? No, okay, maybe this one's actually small, this one's actually reasonable. And you kind of do this iterative process where you try it as best to include only the parameters that you're certain are gonna matter. And you're probably gonna be wrong, but you can kind of iterate on that um, and, and, and go from there. That's the the way that this works more in practice than it does in the classroom. Yes, I think the, the, way I, with, with the, the way I got that question from was like, I thought at first uh, the young modulus matter, not the ill stress, mm -hmm. but the dimensions for those curves are the same. So yeah. You know, if you choose the right one or wrong. So, this is just a general 
kind of, if you take a class on like elasticity theory, um, what you'll find is that if you do, if you're doing an experiment where you're controlling load, elastic modulus is not important forever. Elastic modulus drops out of the problem. So here we're controlling load, we're controlling like a modified load, it applies stress intensity factor. So it's, we're effectively controlling the, the applied stress. So whenever you're controlling load or, or stress, Young's modulus generally doesn't matter. If you're controlling displacement and you're kind of fixing how much you're moving this thing up and down, Young's modulus is important. So that kind of comes into the intuition side of this where like some of this does rely on like you need to go off, take other classes, do research and kind of build up like, okay, they're usually neglecting this, why? Oh, it's because the, 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 you know, it cancels out when you look at the, the stress and the young modulus, we see that, you know, E cancels out. So it's completely reasonable to be like, I would expect young modulus to matter. However, we're doing a load controlled experiment, young modulus ends up falling out. So some of that is experience and intuition. Oh, thank you. Is there any way to approach the exact value of alpha? So yeah, sure. So, you know, if for instance, you, uh, you get here and you say, great, this is lovely. I, I'm glad I have this, but I would like to know still what alpha is. And I'm not worried about the scalability of this problem. Well, what you can see here is that they vary delta n and they measured crack length. What this is saying is that you need to find a way to vary the load asymmetry r. So you can take your same sample and instead of doing a nice sine wave up and down to n max and n min being a ratio of say one, you vary that load asymmetry parameter. And also alpha might depend on this ratio of Yield stress root H over KIC. That one's more complicated to vary. It's very difficult to vary the yield stress and the stress intensity factor. It's a fixed material property. However, you can vary H. So you can run, you can kind of see how this becomes a significantly more complicated experiment. To figure out alpha, you need to run tests where you vary the load asymmetry and then fix the load asymmetry and vary Z, which is the yield stress root H over KIC. And that will, you'll again have more empirical scalings. You'll have more data where you have an exponent here. And from that, you should be able to back out alpha. All right, so it is, the end of class, and uh, I'll see you on Tuesday. Send me your homework or email, and be prepared to, if you're courageous uh, and willing, uh, the volunteer to talk through one of the problems. All right, have a nice weekend.